We live in such an amazing community. I'm just so, so overwhelmed by this. Thank you so much. Let me start. My name is Murray Rankin. I'm the Member of Parliament for Victoria. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our panelists a little bit later as they, as they take the stage and, uh, and speak with us. I first, if I may, please acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on Lagunquin People Territory. Uh, this is, of course, the Coast Salish peoples, currently known as the Squamalt and uh, Songhees First Nations. Thank you very much. I also want to say that we tried to have this uh, particular event live transcript for people who were deaf and hard of hearing. We got halfway there. The projector apparently doesn't work. But here's the good news. If anybody has a smartphone and is interested in this, there will be a live stream text of it shown on your iPhone. Who knew? And all you have to do is go to the following website. If you're interested in this, I'll give you the website. If you'd like uh, it again, just ask. It is www.west.typewell, T-Y-P-E-L, T-Y-P-E-Well, dot com, slash, G-H-D-M-H-A-P-E. Is that clear? <laughs> I wish we could do it, but this is the best we've got. We could, you can see a live stream on the text if you go to the following website. One more time www.west.typewell.com slash G-H-D-M-H-A-P-E. So there. Anyway, I just want to say to you once again that I'm just so moved by the turnout, and I'm also by the response that Bill C-51 has generated in our community. You know, since the government introduced the bill, only on January 30th, I know that I and Randall have received just an absolute flood of letters, emails, and phone calls from constituents. I've heard from UVic students who want to have a petition against this bill. We're going to move on that. I've had uh, folks walk into my community office on 4th Street and ask how they can help to stop this bill. I've had newspaper clippings literally taped to my office window with a thank you card to the opposition. That's the level of concern that this bill has generated. Terrorist violence is a real threat. I know the uncertainty and fear people feel. I heard the gunshots outside the caucus room door on October 22nd. But this flawed bill does not just offer a false choice, it offers a false choice between our values and our security, and it fails on both counts. In Parliament, we've heard Stephen Harper, thank you, it's a false choice that the government wants you to believe between this bill and succeeding against terrorism. We don't accept that false choice. We think it's inconsistent with Canadian values, and you're going to hear some experts elucidate that tonight. And we think, as, a, as, a, as just on functional terms in dealing with security effectively, it fails that test as well. We've tried to hold Stephen Harper accountable in Parliament for the fundamental flaws in this bill. And the Conservatives have continued to ignore the chorus of concern that's building across this country. They've tried to railroad this bill into a committee, and only an NDP filibuster forced them to back down and allow more witnesses to be heard. My colleague Randall Garrison, who will introduce in a moment, has just done amazing work on this, and he put it really well. He said, We'll sit nights, we'll see, sit weekends, we'll do what it takes to give this bill the scrutiny it deserves. Thank you, Randall. Really appreciate it. <laughs> and in case you wondered what it looks like, here it is. 65 pages of turgid prose. How many bills, how many other statutes does it amend? 26. 26 statutes. Another omnibus bill. Do you remember those? We've had so many. Here to tell you what the bill actually says, in very short order, is the Vice Chair of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, the Member of Parliament for Esquimalt Juan de Fuca, Randall Garrison. Well, thanks everyone, and uh, when we started organizing this, I said, I said big haul, big haul. Uh, I know our community is very concerned about this. But I want to say that uh, even though, as the public safety critic, I get the privilege of playing a lead role on this, it's teamwork in our caucus. And I, I want to point those of you who, who are real geeks 
to Murray's speech in the House of Commons. You can find that. You should read his speech. Uh, I know some excerpts were in the Times column. So really fine speech at second reading against this girl. Uh, I have three pages of notes here, and I'll tell you why. That's to cut it down. I've already spoken in the House of Commons for over seven hours this week. Uh, on this bill, and conservatives got so tired of it, one of them actually uh, resorted to sticking his tongue out at me. <laughs> very dignified, very dignified debate. Uh, as one Twitter wag said, this conservative government has a knack for introducing legislation that inspires hundreds of law professors to sign open letters. <laughs> and we're fortunate to have one of the signatories that open a uh, letter with us who will be introduced uh, later on. But I have to say, this time they've outdone themselves. Now we have an open letter signed by four former prime ministers, five former Supreme Court justices, three former ministers of justice, four former public safety ministers, and three former members of the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which is the CSIS review agency that the government likes to call robust. Okay, That's a pretty impressive list of people from all parties, from all parties, uh, who have said, this bill is a danger to the fight against terrorism and to our civil liberties both. And I think that should cause the government to step back. Now I want to say a little about process. I'm probably way more fascinated by parliamentary process than uh, anyone else in the room. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about the first thing we did, which is called a reasoned amendment. And there were, I got some questions about this from people. So why did we move an amendment? At second reading, which is the vote in principle in Parliament, there's only one thing the opposition can do, and that's to move an amendment which lays out the reasons for not proceeding. So it's not an attempt to amend the bill. It's called a reasoned amendment. It simply says, this should go no farther for the following reasons. And so I had the privilege of moving that motion for the opposition. I believe the text of it's in the back. It's certainly online, if, if anyone wants to have a close look. Uh, but let me just lay it out very quickly. Uh, the bill is overly broad, so it covers way too much in the bill. It's dangerously vague. It invents all kinds of new terms that don't exist in law and has no definitions for them. It will probably be ineffective against terrorism, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And it's a major threat to our civil liberties. And finally, it has nothing at all in it to provide more oversight so we've argued if you're going to increase the powers of your security agencies, you have to have a corresponding increase in the ability of civilian authorities to oversee what they're doing, especially CSIS, which operates in secret. And the last thing it said was it has nothing to uh, bring forward programs to counter radicalization of youth, which is the single most effective thing we can do to combat terrorism. Not a word in the bill. Despite the fact that we've repeatedly heard ministers saying the bill covers that and uh, accuse us of not reading the bill, I would say that's a little bit of projection on their part. Uh, I've read the bill several times. So I want to make, uh, make it clear to everybody that I personally, and, I, and the NDP believes, the threat is real. There is a real terrorism threat. But what has to happen is that we have to do things that meet the real threats and do so effectively. And so casting a really huge net, which draws in thousands and thousands of people, uh, I like to use the analogy, the police and uh, CSIS say looking for terrorists is like looking for a needle in the haystack. And the last thing they need is more hay. <laughs> and so when you start spreading the net very broadly and collecting all this information without expanding your resources, you are bound to miss the real threats. And so not only does it threaten our civil liberties, it threatens the war or the, the struggle against terrorism. And this is a government, of course, that says it's very serious about this. They're so serious they've cut the budget of the RCMP every year since 2012. They've cut the budget of CSIS every year since 2012. And CERC, Security Intelligence Review Committee, which reviews CSIS, has the same budget it did 10 years ago. But this year they put in an increase. And the estimates just came down, and the increase is $10,000. <laughs> That's simply so they can spin it that they've increased the budget. Right? That's what you'll hear them say. We've increased the budget for CERC. I've already heard it three times in Parliament. So we went and looked, $10,000. Um, so the reason amendment was voted on, as was uh, C-51 at uh, second reading. So that's the vote in principle. Uh, New Democrats, of course, voted against it. I will give a shout out to the Green Party, who also voted against it. Yes. The Liberals and the Conservatives both supported it.
Uh, I will also say, uh, Public Safety Committee, uh, Elizabeth May has asked to be able to take a seat at the committee uh, during the hearings on this, and the NDP is supporting that request, although we doubt that it will be allowed. <laughs> now let me talk a little bit about the filibuster. Uh, filibuster seat is uh, a word that means delay, really. Talking to, to delay. We were not trying to delay the bill. What we were doing was debating the organization of the public hearings, the number of people and when we would hear from them. And so it's a quirk in the House of Commons rules that that's one thing that you can't have closure of the debate on. You can talk as long as you like about how many witnesses and when, because normally there's not much to say about that. And so we found, uh, on the first day in camera, we found seven hours of things to say about that. <laughs> and the Conservatives got more and more irritated. Um, and uh, their original offer, I'll be, I'll be very frank with you, that was in camera, it's since been leaked, so everyone knows. It was three meetings and to allow the official opposition to call six witnesses on this bill, six. So uh, we just simply said, we're gonna be here a very long time. And we said, we'll, we'll meet your deadlines. If you say it's necessary to finish these by Easter, we'll meet that. And as Murray already said, we went, we went out in public and said, we'll meet, we'll meet in the evenings, we'll meet on weekends, we'll meet during the constituency break weeks, because we think the most important thing is to have full and complete airing of what's in this bill so the public knows what the government is doing. And the Conservatives said that. <laughs> so uh, once uh, the debate broke out in public, and I'm not allowed to talk about how that happened, but the committee meetings started <laughs> taking place in public, uh, the Conservatives then found themselves in a bit of a pickle. If they didn't offer more, they were going to look really bad. Uh, so we were calling for 25 meetings. Now, why did we pick a number like that? Because that would allow for between 80 and 100 witnesses total, and our share would have, of that would have been around 40 witnesses. And we already had 60 requests from groups and individuals with in expertise on this bill who wanted to appear. It's not an unreasonable amount. When the first anti-terrorism bill was adopted in 2001, they heard 80 witnesses over 19 meetings. So not an unreasonable request at all. The Conservatives got so frustrated, on Thursday, they simply adopted bully tactics. They ignored the rules, written rules of the House of Commons, that say you can't call the question on this. The chair, who's a very honorable conservative, ruled against them. They challenged the chair, overruled the chair, broke the rules of the House of Commons, and went ahead and said, we're going to have the eight uh, days of hearings, which results in about 14 witnesses for us. So a small victory, I would say, for, for the public and then we'll hear a few more voices. Uh, and we've appealed to the speaker today to say, how, how can a committee ignore the written rules of the House of Commons? It's the bully tactics and the, the lack of respect, uh, respect for parliamentary democracy uh, in its most extreme form that we've seen in this parliament. The rules don't matter. We won, we have a majority, we'll do what we like. And the part that I think didn't hit the public was that then we were given three hours to submit our witnesses. Uh, having not known how many we have, now we expected they might do this, we were relatively ready, uh, but three hours. So on Thursday afternoon, you had to contact people, see if they're willing to appear, have their contact information, and have it all submitted by 6 p.m. Right? That's the kind of government this is, a bullying government. Uh, so we've, we've done that, and we'll see uh, how successful we are in getting people uh, before the committee. Now, I'm already going on too long. Let me talk about just some, uh, what's in the bill, where is it all quickly? That's absolutely impossible. Uh, but there are some themes. Uh, the first theme that I talked about before is this bill is vague and has poorly defined concept throughout the bill. That should worry you. This is law we're talking about. Now, when uh, the uh, Minister of Justice was asked about the definition of, of terrorism, he said, we're not gonna get bogged down in details. <laughs> Go look it up, he said. Not, ignoring the fact that this bill, of course, changes that for many things, but not for the criminal act of terrorism, but for almost everything else. Um, so there's a new, new offense, and uh, I'm sorry I'm being ironic tonight, uh, but the new offense is, is a criminal offense to promote terrorism, and here's the legal term, in general. It actually says, in general. What legal meaning could that possibly have? Uh, and the other problem with that, of course, is it's already illegal to promote specific acts of terrorism. So we've been asking the government to say, why this new offense? What is this? What does it do? Uh, 
A second example um, is that it now, in the bill, the government likes to talk about terrorism in public. In the bill, it talks about the security of Canada. So it shifts very subtly from terrorism, which everybody's against, and everybody can understand why you may need to do some things, to security of Canada, which includes infrastructure, like pipelines, which includes financial and economic security, uh, which includes a whole raft of things that are now laid out, that are now subject to surveillance, right, and possibly subject to detention. So a very serious concern throughout the bill is this very vague, uh, very general kinds of things uh, that are there. A second concern that runs through the bill is that it lowers the threshold for the government to act against citizens. So we've had fairly uh, high standards for saying the government can't act against you unless it actually has things like evidence. Right? And one of the lawyers I was talking about said, for some of these things we have a standard of evidence that is about as low as you could imagine, and the government just lowered that. So I know some others will talk about this, but one of the things that's uh, very worrying is it moves the definition for action from reasonable to believe something will take place to suspect that it might happen. Okay? You should all be very worried about that. Right? To suspect that it might happen is not a standard for which you can present evidence. Right? Reasonable to believe it will happen. Okay, law enforcement sees this, can present evidence on that. Suspect it might happen. There's no evidentiary standard that you can use. Uh, and so the courts will be quite challenged, or on the other hand, this, with this government's record, the government will be quite challenged to have this bill stand up in the court. So three things missing. Um, I've already said no oversight, uh, but I, I think I need to stop for a minute because the government always says, CSIS has oversight. They do not. They have review. And it seems like a technicality, but here's a very important difference. Oversight is someone who in real time supervises what CSIS is doing because they do it in secret. And there was a, such a person called the Inspector General of CSIS until 2012. And that person reported to the minister and the director of CSIS, had access to all their files, all their documents, and was responsible was to say, CSIS agents are obeying the law. Because there's eliminated that position. It's gone. There is no such position. And they say, well, CERC will take care of that, except that CERC has no capacity or ability to do uh, real-time oversight, which is very important because it's secret things that are being done. Um, a third thing, I guess, uh, a second thing that's missing, as I said, there's nothing to counter radicalization of youth. Uh, the government has some stale plans on its drawing board that remain unfunded and unimplemented, and so it says we have a plan. Yes, it's three years old, uh, you've not done anything with it, and it has no money. So it's a great plan, right? Nothing to do with what's actually going on, and the communities, in particular the Muslim communities country, is way ahead of the government in trying to put together concrete measures to help counter radicalization. And we need to work with the Muslim community in this country to make sure that that's a success. So uh, I'm gonna conclude by saying the third thing that's not there is a thing called evidence. And so Murray made reference to the shooting on Parliament Hill uh, in October. There was the incident in saint jean Richelieu in which two members uh, together of uh, the Canadian Forces lost their lives. We have no reports on those incidents. No completed investigations reports. Yet this bill, the government says, responds to those threats. I don't know how they know that. And the Prime Minister was asked in his campaign style rally, how do you know that this would have prevented those? And he said, oh, we can't be sure about that. Okay. So we're passing an anti-terrorism bill based on the supposition that it might meet the threats that are out there without the government presenting any evidence that that is true. And the last one, again, one of my ironic favorites, uh, at his press conference, Prime Minister was asked, was this bill directed at 13-year-olds in the basement who hadn't let, learned proper boundaries of use of the internet? And he said yes. <laughs> right? He said yes. So again, it comes back to resources. We have limited resources to devote to the real threats to our society, and we should not waste them on 13-year-olds in the basement, when in fact what we should be doing is having the programs that counter radicalization uh, that those 13-year-olds might run into. And so that's my sort of summary of the bill. It's not a legal summary. It's the kind of thematic reasons that many, many parts of this bill are seriously flawed. And I know we have two panelists who will talk a bit more about this. So again, I'm so encouraged to see so many people out. Uh, we have to raise our voices. Uh, I, I'm not an optimist on this one, I have to say. But 
Uh, I wasn't an optimist on the Unfair Voting Act, and we did get some significant changes in that through public opinion forcing the government. And I'll have to say, when our public safety meeting went public, when it went on the air live, we received 200, more than 200 calls in the first two hours in my office in Ottawa saying, keep going, we care about this. Because the concerns were saying, you're just going on and on and nobody in the public really cares about this, right? They just want us to do something about terrorism. And so, again, I'm very encouraged. And after this meeting, if you feel inspired, you have to let the government know that you are listening and you do know what they're up to in this one. Thanks very much. Great job, Randall. Um, so we have two amazing speakers to follow, and then we're going to have lots of time for question and answer. So bear with us. We're going to have a, 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 a large, long discussion. I promise people will be out of here by 8.30, quarter to 9. Don't worry, okay? <laughs> we'll do it. Um, the first people, the question. <laughs> he's going to fill it, although Randall may filibuster, but he'll be doing it by himself. <laughs> um, you know, the first question that I'm sure is on your mind is just the simplest one. Will this bill do what it set, sets out to do? Will it address the real threats of terrorism? Will it make us safer? Well, I'm so, so pleased to have as our uh, uh, Reg Whitaker with us. Professor Whitaker may be known to you. He's a national expert on this topic of, of, of national security. Emeritus Professor of York University, Adjunct Professor at the University of Victoria, co-author of a book entitled Secret Service, the first comprehensive uh, history of political policing in Canada. Reg was an advisor uh, to the uh, O'Connor Commission on Mayor Arar, the inquiry into Mayor Arar, and he's advised the Commission of Inquiry into the air in the bombing issue. He is really an expert, and we're so grateful he lives right here in Victoria and came to give us a, a hand at explaining it. Thanks so much, Rich. Good evening. It's really nice to see all these people out here. Um, when the government brought in Bill C-51, they were really saying, and in, in as many words they were saying, uh, if we're going to give you more security, you're going to have to give up some of your liberties. That balance has to be changed. Now, when a government comes to you and says that they want extraordinary powers, that they want to sort of, you know, redraw the line between the state and society, uh, I think there's a number of questions that parliamentarians uh, and, and the public should address to a government that's asking uh, making that kind of, uh, of a request. The first question is, has the problem that you're seeking to solve been clearly defined? And the answer to that is no. It certainly has not. Uh, the Prime Minister kicked it all off, uh, not in before Parliament, not before the Canadian people, but at a Conservative Party rally. And, and he said, a great evil has been descending upon our world. Yeah. Well, that's what he said. Yeah. And now, the problem, in, 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 now they say it's terrorism. Terrorism is the greatest threat we've ever faced. I thought we had a lot of other, t you know, threats like global, you know, warming and so on, but no, terrorism. But, it, when you look at the definitions of terrorism, and Randall's already spoken to this uh, in the bill, they are not only overbroad, as lawyers like to say, they're vastly overbroad. They've extended way beyond terrorism to include almost anything that interferes, for example, with the economic or financial stability of Canada that might affect their critical infrastructures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And even when they're talking about terrorism, and again, Randall's book about this, they talk about terrorism in general. You know, I mean, this is, uh, it, it's, it's just to cover everything, it's sort of drip net fishing um, out there. That, uh, and so, it, this, is, this is a serious problem. The second question is, is to ask the government that's asking for these new powers, have you used the existing powers that you have? And the answer to that is no. Now, in 2001, after 9-11, the, the liberal government at the time passed the first anti-terrorism act, 
And they introduced two extraordinary new powers, preventive detention and investigative hearings. And they were so controversial that, in fact, they put sunset clauses on them. And it's about 15 years now. You know how many times they've used preventive detention and investigative hearings? Never. Not once. Not once. Now they want to extend the period for preventive detention for all the people that they haven't detained. Uh, that's one. It, now they, they talk about new offenses for promoting and advocating terrorism. We already have on the criminal code incitement to violence as a criminal offense. We have hate speech laws, and they could be used and have not been uh, have not been used effectively at all. The third question is: Are the new powers proportionate to the threat? And here the answer is clearly no. They are wildly disproportionate to the threat. Now I'll just, I'll just quickly try to run over a few things. And these start out as sort of reasonably good ideas, in, you know, just sort of say them in general. For one thing, in better information sharing. We know that before 9-11 uh, happened in the US that it could have been prevented if the CIA had talked to the FBI and if parts of the FBI had talked to other parts of the FBI and so on, but they didn't, and so inform key information was lost. Um, so, okay, let's have better information sharing to combat terrorism. What they've done is that they've opened it up in a way that destroys the basic privacy protections, good reasons why your data that is picked up by one government department uh, is, doesn't, isn't allowed to talk to the database that another government department has in you because, in fact, you don't want a 1984 society in which government knows everything about you. They've knocked down those barriers and, uh, and supposedly just for terrorism, but who knows what that could be, could be used for. Uh, stopping promotion of jihad on the internet. Okay, that's got to be everybody agree with that. You don't want to have that sort of thing going on. It's so broadly drawn, however, that it imperils the right of freedom of expression much more generally. The no-fly list, they said they were improving the no-fly list. What they've done, actually, and I could go on at this at some, at some length, but I won't. I'll just say this, that what they've done is that they have now created a no-fly list that will look like the discredited American no-fly list that we put ours into place in order to prevent the Americans imposing theirs on us. Now, we, you know, the, the no-fly list in the U.S. that says that, uh, you know, a two-year-old toddler wasn't allowed to get on a plane. They said your mother can go on the plane, but the two-year-old's got the name of a terrorist, so you couldn't go on. Uh, that's what they're, that's what they're going to give us. But the worst thing, the worst thing of all, in my view, in this bill, is the CSIS disruption warrants, which they are now saying that CSIS, not the RCMP, but CSIS should be able to disrupt terrorist plots. Well, the RCMP is already doing that. They're doing it very effectively. They did it with the Toronto 18, uh, and you know, they in undercover sources that provided, you know, sort of ineffective explosive materials. They did it with a pair that are now on trial here for trying to put a bomb at the legislature in Canada today, um, and again, they disrupted it. But the RCMP does this with a view to law enforcement, because they're a law enforcement agency. So, and they're looking uh, down the road to bringing things to trial. CSIS is not a law enforcement agency, and this is very, very dangerous. But when you read what's actually in this, it is quite unbelievable, and it's truly unbelievable. What they're saying is that they will go in secret to a judge, present the case in secret to a judge, no contrary opinions being offered, and if the judge agrees to provide them with this disruption warrant, they can do basically anything they want. Well, not anything. They're not allowed to torture, murder, rape, I tell you that. Read the bill. That's what it says. 
Uh, but short of that, they can break the law, they can violate charter rights, and they already have a get out of jail free card from the judge to, uh, to do this with impunity and in secret. And we won't even know, that, and the, the people who are the targets of this won't even know because you know, there's, there's no, uh, there's, there's absolutely nothing, uh, 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 no way of finding out what that is. This is so wrong in every sense of the word, but just let me add one thing here. This is to make judges who are supposed to be the arbiters of the constitutionality and legality of government action, who review what government does and says, is this appropriate, is it not appropriate, and they would be drafted into being enablers of law breaking. I don't think judges are going to like this very much, but you know that's what's written into the into the statute. But the next, uh, uh, the fourth question that has to be addressed is: Are there adequate safeguards in place to protect against abuse of these new powers, or potential abuse? Well, really, even the use of these new powers is pretty abusive in itself. Uh, and anyway, the answer to that is no. That what we see is the rapid acceleration of government security powers not matched by any kind of oversight review and indeed by a marked deterioration of the capacity even for the limited review that we've already had uh, in place over the last 15 years. That, uh, that the accountability mechanisms uh, are simply not adequate to the job. Uh, they can't follow uh, the trails uh, of investigation uh, from their stovepipe to CSIS as CERC, uh, and, and many of them uh, don't have any, any oversight at all. Uh, and it's completely and utterly <coughs> inadequate and getting worse. Okay, the last question, and this is the one that I think is really important because you know the government has been saying to the NDP, uh, you know, you're against. You know, you, they say you know you voted against every new security, national security power there is. Said Tom Mulcair is trying to prevent the uh, the police and security from uh, agencies from protecting Canadians against terrorism. Uh, Don't forget we're extremists. Yeah, and extremists. Yeah, right. Uh, but the, 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 the last question is, will these new measures actually increase security? Will they be effective against <coughs> terrorism? And I think the answer to that is very clearly no. Return to the disruption warrants that I was just talking about a moment ago. What we're looking at here is if these things go through and if these things are actually uh, granted and, and, and go into operation, we're going to see a revival of the old RCMP CSIS turf wars. The ones that, for example, over Air India, why did Air India, why was Air India allowed to happen? That was the worst uh, uh, intelligence failure and the worst security disaster in Canadian history. 329 people lost their lives. And uh, how did that, why was that allowed to happen? And why were they never, the, those responsible never brought to justice? Never, the end. And that one of the reasons is that there were these turf wars between the RCMP and CSIS. We're back to it. CSIS is going to be trampling on the jurisdiction of the RCMP. And worse than that is that CSIS is an intelligence agency it's not a law enforcement agency, and it is, the RCMP is always interested in bringing these cases to trial, and now we're gonna have CSIS running around doing these things. They're not interested in going to trial, they're interested in gathering intelligence, but what they do in the course of this could contaminate the evidence, break evidentiary trails, lawyers are horrified at the possibilities, and so we'll probably have failed uh, court cases as a result. Okay, uh, there's uh, the promotion and advocacy provisions, and I'll try to finish up here, um, in that uh, we spoke about a moment ago, are counterproductive to the dialogue with the Muslim community. 
that if you're really talking about de-radicalization programs about, uh, about youth, uh, this is only creating suspicion and, and fear on the part of the Muslim community that anything they say could be used against them in any kind of a dialogue with government uh, on, uh, on these issues. The wildly overbroad definition of terrorism by extending potentially to environmentalists, First Nations, uh, peaceful protesters, uh, and so on, which uh, you know is, is a very serious uh, uh, risk here in this legislation. And with this government that is labeled environmentalists as radicals, foreign financed, etc., uh, and. Uh, at the end, if, if this is indeed the direction they're going, they're risking that CSIS, the RCMP, the enforcement agencies of uh, security and policing are going to lose their social license, which is very important if they're actually going to have the Canadian public behind them in the fight against terrorism, which is a legitimate reason for, uh, for, their, for their actions. But uh, they're going to become extremely unpopular. Remember, you know, this is, there is some history here in the past. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a slam dunk all around uh, that all five of the questions that I suggested should have been addressed all get the same answer. No, the government has failed. Thanks, Rick. You know, the most common question that I hear is, uh, is this bill going to chill free speech and threaten legitimate act activism in Canada? In particular, we're concerned the Conservatives will apply these new powers to First Nations, environmental activists who stand in the way of projects like Enbridge Northern Gateway and Kinder Morgan. I know that concern is what's brought a lot of you here tonight as well. As I said in Parliament, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip was arrested on Burnaby Mountain over the Kinder Morgan issue, and what new threats to privacy and liberty would he have faced if this bill had been law then? Well, to talk about some of these questions, we have an amazing activist who's worked everywhere from the United Nations Refugee Program in Uganda to community organizations right here in Victoria. She's now an instructor in social justice at the University of Victoria and a researcher into nonviolence, social movements, and collective action. Ladies and gentlemen, Laurel Collins. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's so great to see such a great turnout. And I do want to talk about this threat to dissent in Canada. And there's been a lot of conversation about the bill, and I'm just going to recap some of the things that are relevant uh, to this topic in particular. And the first one is this expanded um, kind of spying powers of CSIS and um, that the sharing that will happen. Next is this piece around disruption. I'm going to come back to that. Um, the next one is free speech. And then also these nine descriptions of what undermines the security of Canada. Um, and already mentioned in there was critical infrastructure and the kind of interference with the economic security of Canada, but also covert foreign operations or um, influences is in there as well. And when you link that to the same kind of discourse and language around uh, foreign funded radicals, we start to get this really scary picture of the direction that Canada is headed. So starting with that disruption piece, and so it, as um, Randall pointed out, it stops, and, and Reg as well, it stops at the uh, kind of rape, torture, murder, things that it could actually include and things that other national security agencies do in terms of disruption techniques are breaking and entering, uh, smear campaigns. It's also um, hacking into computers and deleting or uh, swiping, like kind of uh, deleting everything on them, draining bank accounts. So these are just some of the disruption techniques that are possible under this new bill. Um, and then moving on to free speech. And so this bill actually introduces kind of a new speech crime, which is the advocating, kind of encouraging terrorism. And 
we do actually have speech crimes in Canada. The um, hate speech is a crime, but it's limited to public discourse. So this new kind of speech crime would be public and private, which becomes a little, even more scary when you think about CSIS's new powers. And it also, it's not only people who are intending to um, incite terrorism, it's also people who are, and this is a word from the bill, reckless um, in the outcome of their communications. And then when you think about that in connection with what they're considering uh, to be undermining Canadian security, which includes uh, people who are interfering with critical uh, infrastructure and interfering with the financial stability um, of Canada, then you can see the kind of connections that we're, we're making and the impacts for Indigenous communities, for in the environmental movement as a whole. So yeah, I also want to talk about immediately after those kind of nine things that constitute what undermines Canada's uh, security. There's a little caveat that says that this doesn't include lawful protest, advocacy, um, dissent, and, and self-expression, artistic, 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 yeah, exactly, artistic expression. And so um, the key word in there is lawful, because what unlawful dissent includes are sit-ins, um, marches without permits. Um, if you think of the civil rights movements, um, and how many of these really important moments were unlawful acts of civil disobedience. And all of these unlawful acts of civil disobedience can now be kind of put under CSIS's new powers. Um, also, wildcat strikes, so um, strikes that aren't uh, according to traditional labor laws. Um, so yeah, and then I want to add to that just the recently leaked RCMP documents and the kind of language um, that they're describing environmental activists and indigenous activists. They're calling them um, violent Aboriginal extremists and uh, anti-petroleum extremists or anti-Canadian petroleum extremists, <laughs> which it kind of boggles the mind. They're lumping in nonviolent um, civil disobedience and uh, people who are engaged in this kind of uh, peaceful protesting with what undermines the security of Canada. And it's, it's kind of terrifying. Um, and then I also wanted to bring out a couple things from those leaked RCMP documents. If you have a chance, there's, I think it's just 12 pages, take a look at it. It's titled something along the lines of threats to critical infrastructure in Canada. Um, and they, I mean, for the first thing is they, they kind of call into question the legitimacy of climate change, uh, which is scary that the RCMP documents are doing this. Um, and they also focus on Northern BC and New Brunswick. And so specifically indigenous communities who are fighting against pipelines, who are fighting against fracking. Um, and they, they label those as hotspots for this threat to Canadian security. Um, and so that kind of ties in to this, how this bill is also undermining Section 35, the rights of the Aboriginal peoples. And I'm not qualified to talk about it, but I think that this is also a, another missing piece in this conversation where we need to be thinking about how Aboriginal rights are undermined by this bill. Um, yeah, so those, all of those things. <laughs> paint a really scary picture for dissent in Canada. And I'm really interested in kind of how social movements um, develop and evolve. Social movements aren't just these kind of strategic things that um, block certain policies or um, projects that we don't want to happen. They're also about forging collective identities. They're about building community. And these bills are threatening that. They're, they're actually undermining First of all, who wants to be involved in collective action? Because all of a sudden, you are potentially going to be spied upon, potentially going to be detained without charge. It, it makes it much more risky for people to join in these actions. Then, if you actually do decide to, and you're building community with people, and you're afraid that maybe your friend is a CSIS agent, or um, that CSIS is planting agent provocateurs in your movement, it, it undermines that community that we're building. 
And then for the people who are on the front lines, and these are mainly indigenous communities um, and environmental activists who are there risking that, putting themselves in danger, they are then going to be criminalized with this bill. Um, and I, I, I hate to paint this really scary, bleak picture. And so I want to end on um, a quote that is from Mahatma Gandhi. And he was engaged in so many unlawful acts of civil disobedience. The salt march is kind of the one that sticks out the most. Um, but he said, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now it's your turn. Please ask any questions of any panelists or all panelists that you'd like, but if I could just ask you to keep your questions short and please make them questions rather than statements so we can hear from as many people as we can. You know, it's just amazing to see the sea of faces here today. <laughs> you could all just, it's just remarkable. Thank you. Who's first? Yes, we got a mic right here. It might be easier just so we can make sure we have a transcript of want to look at it later. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is, are we following what Obama did with habeas corpus? Where if they take you away and you're detained and your family doesn't know where you are, are they going to allow you at least to have a lawyer and a phone call? Good question. Um, right. Rich, do you have a yeah, question? I, well, actually, yes. Um, that, that, is, uh, I, that was certainly in the original uh, uh, preventive detention. I don't believe that's been taken away. So, sorry. Oh. So, uh, the people at the back won't be able to understand that. They won't be able to see that. Why don't you come oh. up here? Well, I'll bring you up one by one as, as required. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say that actually, um, that uh, in the preventive detention uh, power, that actually it does give you, a, there is a, a, a lawyer, and it is circumscribed in time. It, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't get too worried about that one. As they say, they've never even used it anyway. So um, it it's, doesn't seem like the most alarming power. Uh, uh, and uh, it is limited. But, uh, yes, Heather. <clears throat> so I'd like to follow up a little bit on how this threatens Aboriginal rights and title. Rights and title, I want to emphasize as well. And um, a great Indigenous activist, Pam Palmater, calls this bill a Trojan horse because she says the veneer is for terrorism and the inside part is for activism. So if we think of this threatening things like um, pipelines and those protests, I guess a specific question I would like to ask related to British Columbia would be around coastal First Nations. They've had to deal with a very flawed negotiation process the rights to duty to consult are, are very, very um, weak. And so if you couple this legislation with weak um, regulations about cons consultation, then you're left with no option for them to do anything else but probably blockades and so on, and it's gonna be criminalized. So does this mean that the courts are gonna be really- What's the question? The question is, will the courts be backed into um, having no other alternative than to be charging people with criminal offenses if they do blockades, even though it's their territory and it's rights and title? You take one, you're probably best. There's a very good chance, and I think that she's right, Palmadir is, is right about the fact that there's going to be an intersection of the Aboriginal rights under Section 35 with the the, the rights that are being abrogated in this bill. The problem, of course, is the judges are going to have to look at this with absolutely no evidence. You've heard, Ed, you've heard Randall talk about the failure of evidence. A lot of the discussion is going to take place if we're targeting Aboriginal leaders in close, without any lawyers for First Nations or others there. There's no special advocate. There's no lawyer, of course, by definition, there to look after the interests of anybody but the government. Ceases. So, it's hugely problematic, and I think another point is judges are going to be very resentful about the role we're asking them to play under this law. Yes? I think I'm a terrorist. I'm a raging granny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Take the citizen's arrest. Uh -oh. I don't have a good record because I was in jail for three weeks in 1993. 
on this absurd thing of our contempt of court that none of us understood, anyhow. Um, what, uh, what concerns me is how will the police be involved in this? The regular police and the RCMP, these poor, how will Constable Plod be involved? And I, think, I don't think he's going to be able to disrupt our uh, meetings and pretend to be a raging granny, but it must be a great problem for the police. Uh, well, who else is going to do this? They're not going to send some, somebody from the CSIS over to grab us. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm going to disagree with you. I think they are going to send somebody from CSIS. Uh, that's the point of the disruptive powers. So the disruptive powers are not about the actual criminal act of terrorism. They're about disrupting anything the government and CSIS perceives as a threat to the security of Canada. And so I know, being from Esquimalt, I've seen Raging Grannies doing lots of things in Esquimalt that uh, the government might perceive to be a threat to the security of Canada. So under this bill, I'm not saying they'll have the resources, because I don't think they do, but they have the ability, and I'm gonna differ with Reg. For most of the disruption, they do not have to go to a judge. Only if the disruption involves illegal activities do they have to get a warrant. So this authorizes them to do all kinds of things which aren't strictly illegal, but would be very disruptive to activists and their groups. They don't even have to go to a judge for that. And Murray makes the point, if they do go to a judge, there's nobody to represent the other side. It's, it's a fundamental problem uh, to asking for a warrant to disrupt your threats to Canada when you can't say, but I'm defending my rights if you're an Aboriginal person. You can't say, it's I my right to free speech. You're not there when that warrant is authorized. And when CSIS goes away and carries out that activity, the difference from the police is the police do that in a criminal context where that warrant ends up back in court. And a judge says, what did you do with the warrant? Was that legal? How did you use the warrant? And if it wasn't, the prosecution fails. With CSIS, that warrant will never come back to court. The purpose of CSIS under this is to disrupt, not to bring criminal charges. So no judge will ever see what happens. And if you Follow this carefully, you'll see that CSIS has a very poor record when it applies for warrants in being truthful, and this is the judge's words, that, that CSIS lacked candor in applying for warrants from judges. So it's a very, very serious problem, and I do believe uh, it won't be the RCMP, that's the difference here. They're creating this secret disruptive power, which is extremely dangerous and a fundamental uh, departure from Canadian values. And the other thing that uh, Reg, come on up. The other thing is the turf war that Reg talked about that got us into such trouble with Air India. Here are we giving anybody remember burning barns? Yeah. That's why we created CSIS in the first place to be an intelligence service, not a law enforcement service. Now they're going to let that those lines be blurred and maybe take us right back to where we were before CSIS was created in the first place, Reg. Yeah, I just wanted to say a word about every time uh, it's been raised in, in Parliament about, uh, you know, pipeline protesters and First Nations and so on, they, they jump in and say, oh no, we've taken care of that because we have this exemption for lawful advocacy, protest, dissent, and artistic expression. Um, and the point has been made that, uh, you know, lawful protest and, and, you know, all the ambiguity that that involves with, with civil disobedience and so on, but I'd like to raise something else, which is based on, on the research that I've done, the book that I did on the history of the security service. And there's a long history about this, which is that you go back to the Cold War and they said, well, we're not really interested in you know, legitimate trade unions, um, but we're interested in stopping the communists who are in the trade unions. How do you spy on the communists in the trade unions without spying on the trade unions? So in fact, they end up with tens of thousands of pages of documents based on the spying on all kinds of Canadian, every union in the country. And, and this goes on through the 1970s and in, in, in Quebec, they said, we're interested in the violent terrorists, the FLQ, but they ended up spying on the Parti Québécois, a lawful party, a legitimate political party, because they said they might be, you know, the bad guys might be hiding inside the PQ. How do you distinguish it? The G20 uh, protest in, in Toronto, they said they're these really, you know, the black bloc anarchists, they're really scary people. Yeah, and it's true, they were violence prone. They went on a rampage on, on Saturday and the weekend of that protest 
and, uh, and destroyed all kinds of property and so on. The next day, the police swooped in and, and arrested almost a thousand peaceful protesters, none of whom, all the, all virtually none, none of them ever were actually convicted of anything. They're all like, oh. and, and, but how do you, you know, so the problem is that you can use that question of violence, you know, somebody might blow up a pipeline somewhere down the road. So you can spy upon the entire anti-pipeline Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. Uh, as a constituent of Victoria, I want to thank uh, both of you for holding this town hall and for being so diligent in your opposition in the House of Commons. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm seeking some clarification on what the NDP will do uh, if C-51 passes as government. Uh, on Sunday, Tom Mulcair stated on Global that uh, he was open to amending rather than repealing C-51. Uh, Peter Julian said that you guys would repeal it outright, and I was just wondering, will the NDP as government amend or repeal C-51? So Global has retracted the story as being an error, yeah. but they don't highlight that. <laughs> okay, I just, I saw the interview and it's the last question at the end, and, yeah. and he was, he wouldn't state outright that he would repeal and that he was open to amendment. Okay, I have seen the same interview. Right. But I can tell you, uh, and I talked directly with Tom about it afterwards because I started getting calls immediately. Right. And Tom said, no, it was the contacts that we are committed to repealing this bill. Great, thank you. Thanks for asking that because I was confused. Hi. Hi. We all know there's going to be an election. We all know that the vote is decided in Ontario and Quebec and not here. When will the NDP and the Liberals, just this once, unite and defeat Carter? I'll start. I'll start by saying I like to jokingly say there's nothing this side of the criminal law that I won't do to get rid of Stephen Harper. <laughs> I just wish the Liberals were on side on this particular issue. I mean, I want them to be. They would talk, they've talked about how, if I understand their position, they would, what would they do? They would allow this bill to pass, and when they form government, they would fix it, magically turn it back. My fear about that position is, once you give the secret police these new powers, and they get used to them, and the budgets are created to allow them to use them, and some of the things you've heard about stifling dissent and so forth occur, it's sometimes hard to unscramble the omelette. So I'm very worried about their position on this topic. But I go back to where I started. We've got to get rid of this government. I'll do just about anything legal to do so, as long as it's lawful advocacy protest. Go ahead. I have three very short questions. One, uh, why nobody is mentioning the actual magnitude of the terrorist threat that exists. So uh, compared, for instance, with uh, the threat of uh, workers dying at, at work because there are no uh, sufficient uh, provisions and employers don't do enough to, 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 to prevent accidents. Second, is Obama uh, a terrorist according to this law for blowing the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, The third question uh, is, is the Conservative government uh, possible for being punished by this bill for uh, their uh, industrial practices for endangering Canadian uh, security with uh, their uh, unique mindset on developing uh, uh, and just exporting uh, the natural resources rather than uh, developing the petrochemical industry or something right. like that. So on the first question, uh, thank you for us. Anybody want to tackle that? I could just say this on the first question. When Tom Mulcair did the first speech after the Prime Minister did his, the first thing he talked about, one of the things he talked about was the need to expand what we understand by security. And he referenced the meat, the uh, polluted meat, you know, the contaminated meat listerosis crisis in the meat packing plant. 
talked about Lac Magatique and the security of, of, uh, of, of that community and all sorts of things, putting it in a broader context. When you want to talk about security, a lot of people died in those incidents and we need to bring that into our, our, our frame of reference as well. Well, of course, Mary, I, I agree with what, what you said, but I, but I still want to emphasize that the threat of terrorism is real. And so what Reg said is very important. We have to devote the appropriate resources in the appropriate ways to meet the real threat. And so the question of what is the real threat, I think that's a very important question that the conservatives have failed to answer. And so what they throw out when they ask that question is fear, right? They just exploit the fear in the public rather than giving us a serious answer to that question. So I think that's probably, not to disparage anybody else's questions, but that's one of the most important questions that was asked this evening. And of course, uh, the other two, uh, a bit more rhetorical, but I love them and I plan to use them in the House of Commons. <laughs> and some of the great work that's going on in the United States to de-radicalize, Obama's work, you mentioned in his speech, uh, remember that event they had in the White House? You'll recall they had a, a lot of discussion about how the Somali community in Minneapolis has been de-radicalized and how the community is working together. Those practical steps that are being taken, there's nothing going on in Canada to that effect. What happens when a mother calls and says to an MP, real story, I'm worried about my son, you know, I'm, a, I'm originally from Algeria, my, my son is acting a little strange, do I go to the police? I don't want to go to the police. What do you do? in practical terms. And this goes to the point that there really are concerns in our country. I'm not for a moment minimizing them. The point of this is, is this necessary? Is it going to work? And what about the consequences as a result of introducing it? That's what we're here to talk about. So, uh, I'm really am pleased, of course, we talk about the erosion of uh, Canadian values and uh, so forth. I think that's very important. I think it's absolutely true. But I think we need to go much farther. If we look at the pattern of this government culminating in this bill, I think we need to talk about a, a creeping fascism in this country. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't use, I don't use that term lightly. I'm using the research that was done by Dr. Lawrence Britt in 2003, who examined uh, Hitler's Germany, Mussolini's Italy, Franco Spain and Suharto's Indonesia came up with 14 characteristics of a fascist regime. And I'm just going to read seven of them for which this government qualifies eminently and many more but not so clearly. Powerful and continuing nationalism. Identification of enemy scapegoats and scapegoats as a unifying cause. Supremacy of the military. Obsession with national security, which is what we're talking about here. And a couple more, labor power is suppressed, and obsession with crime and punishment. Now these are all features that this government manifests enormously. My question is, do you think we should be upping the ante and talk about a rising fascism in Canada? question and yeah I think all of those points that you hit apply to our government and it as you were speaking I was reminded of um, Canadians kind of during the anti-apartheid movement and they were able to speak out about that under this new bill um, that actually could be interpreted as supporting terrorism um, similarly if you have strong feelings about um, Palestine or the Ukraine um, and have opinions that are different than your government then that also could fall under this, these uh, speech crimes or the threat to free speech. Um, and so I think, yeah, in my opinion, I would agree with your statement. Okay. Me too. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. That is a great question, and I think that's something we should be concerned about. Um, I would like to first of all commend the NDP for getting some pushback, uh, giving some pushback, and the Green Party for giving pushback on this. Uh, draconian bill. It's disgusting. Um, but uh, you also mentioned uh, it's important to, uh, to identify what is the threat. Uh, so there is copious amounts of evidence that uh, the official story of 9-11, which was the uh, progenitor for most of this war on terror uh, behavior on the part of these governments, Canadian and American, 
And when will the NDP distinguish itself and call for a forensic investigation into what 9-11 really was? Well, I, have, I have a lot of information, if anybody wants it, on uh, the uh, forensic evidence of how the official story doesn't stand up to reason. Thanks. I mean, my, my first answer is that would be an American inquiry, not a Canadian inquiry. Many ca Canadians died yeah, sure, also, sure. so it is a Canadian yeah. uh, 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 legal matter. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, thank if you. If anybody would like some information, I'll be outside in the exit, and I will share with other Canadians the forensic evidence that it demands an investigation into that horrible event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this, and I commend the, uh, the NDP and the Green Party's uh, strong opposition to this bill. Um, a couple of points, uh, so in some ways, reiterations of, of issues that have been raised before, but uh, one is that given that this bill will pass, um, is the, the NDP prepared to work uh, in conjunction, especially with the Green Party, but also with individual Liberals, because this is a 338-seat election. There, there are certainly liberals who are more principled than leadership. And I would say the same even for the, uh, the NDP. And it is absolutely essential not to allow the, the conservatives to take seats, such as the Nanaimo Lady Smith seat, uh, by virtue of, of splitting uh, votes between the, uh, the, the Greens and the NDP. And so is the NDP going to commit itself to essentially working cooperatively with other parties and individual party members so that we make sure that the Harper government is defeated in this coming election. I guess the old adage it takes two to tango is, uh, is important to remember. I mean, Tom, Tom Mulcair has said very clearly that he will do, as Jack has said, we have to, Jack Layton said, we need to work together, we want to work together. And I think he's been very clear on that. Uh, that was, uh, that was a few months ago when he said that. There's been no uh, reply from the leader of the Liberal Party to that to that in the treaty. So we'll have to see if they if they change. Secondly, I haven't yet seen any evidence that Liberal MPs. I take your point. We're going to have more members in uh, in the future with 338. But in the current Parliament, Randall and I watched as they stood up one by one by one and voted with the government on this. Thank you. Next. Hi. Um, I was listening to the CBC The Current this Monday and um, they had a thing on this uh, issue and a couple of uh, people are doing um, um, a, a, a website called the antiterrorlaw.ca, uh, Craig Forsese and Kent Roach. Kent right. Roach was on, the, um, on this current. He said as of last Monday they were only halfway through this bill and then the next two guests say, oh they read the bill and of course they support it. So I think there's something each of us can do when, when they hear somebody on the radio saying they've read the bill. They haven't read the bill. They haven't understood the bill. It's, I mean, these guys are still working on it. So this is something everybody can do. Call them on it. Very good. That's excellent. And I, I really agree with your, your reference to Kent, uh, Kent and Roach and Colin Forsese. If you just Googled R-O-A-C-H and F-O-R-C-E-S-E, -E, you'll find their blog. They've done five in-depth analyses so far and it's very, very instructive. So thank you for that. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I'm just curious. Um, do you think that the government will, or individuals, MPs will change their mind if these powers end up being used on them? Um, in the US, Diane Feinstein did a 180 when she found out the NSA was spying on members of government. So I'm just wondering if you think the same will happen or Go ahead. Uh, under, under existing law, uh, the government of Canada has spied on Tommy Douglas for 50 years, right? Environmental groups are already being uh, monitored. Petroleum. Yeah, I'm not going to call them <laughs> anti-petroleum groups. They're already being monitored, and we know uh, very well that some of their activities have been disrupted by the RCMP. So the focus is not on the government. It's on the government directing, uh, either directly, in this case, and I do accuse the government of that, or indirectly, uh, those forces toward the people they perceive as the enemies of Canada because they're the enemies of the government. 
And that's really very destructive of our democracy. So it's already taking place, and this expands that whole trend. And again, uh, Laurel made reference to the RCMP. Very shocking uh, memo that creates this whole new category of anti-petroleum activists and just lumps everybody together, me, you, uh, probably everybody in this room gets lumped into the same category as, and then the next sentence says, and violent extremists. So they're already doing this, but I really, I take your rhetorical point, it's directed against the government, but the government's in charge here. And one of the very disturbing things of the conservative government is we had a tradition of the independence of the RCMP and the independence of CSIS as agencies. And it's very clear that neither the, commis the current commissioner nor the current director of CSIS acts independently of this government. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I would like to think that there, that there could be conservative dissent from this. And now if you go back just a couple of years ago, there was a bill that was brought in, a uh, government bill, uh, electronic surveillance, uh, which was brought in by then Minister Vic Taves. Uh, and he renamed it the uh, Child Pornography Bill and said, you know, if you're either with us or you're with the child pornographers, if you oppose this. And actually all hell broke loose, and not least of which was in the conservative base itself. And people that, that were calling in on, you know, in Alberta uh, talk shows and so on, saying, you know, what, what the hell are they doing? And, uh, you know, what, what business is it of theirs to get? I, I think in some ways it's, it, They've been trying to rush this bill through so quickly and so much in the dark because they don't want people to actually see it. And that includes their own people as well. And you know, maybe if we could sort of hold this up long enough and bring up these points that in fact, maybe some of their own support might weaken a little bit. <laughs> Not to scare you even further, but this afternoon I was on the Ian Jessup show and a caller called in and said, is this like the McCarthy era in the 1950s where everybody was a communist and people were worried about reds under the bed and all of that uh, chill, the kind of chill that uh, Laurel talked about. And I said, you know, at one level it's worse. And the reason it's worse is because rather than the word communist, you now substitute the word terrorist. And if you're on this list, what's worse is that 16 government departments now will get all the information in a technology that did not exist in the 1950s. It's called the internet. And all of a sudden, the information about you is available across the, can uh, the Canadian government with no worries about privacy, and then to other agencies, CIA, etc., across the world. So it's the technology that makes it even more frightening if you think about part one, the information sharing provisions of C-51. Just another thought. Yes? I'm a professor at the University of Victoria. I teach Canada, mainly outside the country. Um, my field is the arts, um, history, and politics. Um, I'm regularly invited to go and talk about Canada outside our country. Um, as an aside, and very quickly, the Canadian government under Harper completely cut all funding to all Canadian study centers around the world with the stroke of a pen. And the network that I've been working on for 30 years is very quickly disappearing. We are being isolated from the rest of the world by the Canadian government under Harper. My question is this. Um, I'm actually a visitor. I'm from Saanich. Elizabeth May is my member of parliament. I'm very proud of her. Every so often she sends around on her, well she, she has on her website, uh, a petition. And if I sometimes decide I want to sign this petition, I bring it up and when I click on it, on my screen for a nanosecond comes up e-activist. And so someone, as you were saying, is keeping very close track of this. Now, for the first time in my long career, I sort of hesitate writing to members of parliament. Sure and hesitate to sign Elizabeth May's petitions because it may put me on a no-fly list. And I would like to know what your, you, the panelists, think of this option of me being on a no-fly list if this bill were to pass, just because I have participated in what perhaps might be considered non-lawful dissent. Thank you. Very good question. Rich, Rich Whitaker has done an enormous amount of work on this issue, so I'll turn it over to him. 
was actually advising the Canadian government on, uh, on airport security and air security. And when the, when the no-fly list first came in, uh, it was specifically, you know, I can say that publicly, but it was to make sure that the American list didn't get applied to Canadian travelers to the U.S. And they did try to keep it fairly narrow and really said, you know, the only people they were going to keep off planes uh, were the ones that they had good intelligence that they represented a, a potential threat to aircraft, not just a potential threat in some general way. That has now gone with this new legislation if it goes through. And the vast expanses of drift net uh, definition of, of, of terrorism or threats to security that's in here. Anybody pops up, I mean, you know, it could be some clueless teenager, you know, uh, putting out something on the internet saying, you know, ah, jihadism is cool. And suddenly, you know, he's, he's on the list. But it could be worse than that. It could, or somebody like yourself, as you say. But it could be worse than that. It could be that you just have the same name as that clueless teenager. And the problem is that it's the air carriers who have to enforce this. And they could actually be subject to action by the government if they fail. And so they're going to cover their butts. And that was one of the problems in the US with the no-fly list. So Senator Edward Kennedy was told he couldn't fly because, you know, maybe they had an IRA suspect or something that was, you know, had that name, I, who knows. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think your fears are... I think my concern with the bill is more, it's less about terrorism and much, much more about the establishment of a secret police. Canadian spy on the <laughs> I'm going to echo the sentiment of 